There were more ladies here tonight than there were men, apparently. Uh, we are, uh, the ladies are going to be, they, they've got a class going on tonight where they're talking about teaching and uh, what, uh, what they can do as, as far as teaching goes in the church. Uh, and so we're going to spend a little time tonight just talking about uh, our roles and responsibilities as men uh, in leading in worship. And uh, this is something that we get to talk about occasionally uh, just to uh, refresh uh, our minds about the things that we're doing when we uh, take opportunities and have opportunities to get up and, and to take a role in the, in the public worship of the church. And so uh, hopefully some of this will be helpful. A lot of, some of this will be a little review from things we've talked about before, but uh, never hurts to be reminded of things. That's why your, wi that's why your wife reminds you uh, to do things sometimes because it never hurts uh, to be reminded uh, of certain things. So what, what I'd like to do, we're going to talk about some of the, uh, some of the mechanics and logistical things of, uh, of actually leading and serving, uh, but I wanted to start just with uh, some biblical background and some, kind of a biblical foundation uh, for, for this tonight, and I think if, if we're really going to, if we're going to be more adept and more uh, in tune with and more effective in leading in worship, before we focus on the mechanics, before we focus on the how-tos and how-not-tos, maybe, um, I think we need to back up and just talk about, just talk about worship and, and what it is. Um, are we good, Nate? Um, and, and first thing I'd like to do is just focus on the Greek word for worship. That How many times have you heard the Greek word for worship? 417 times? Uh, you heard it that many times? Uh, 418, because I just said it. If I'd asked you before, 417, but now it's 418. You're right, Chuck. He, man, this guy is quick. So, proskuneo, big deal. It's a Greek word. Um, it's not going to be on the final test. It's not going to be in a spelling bee or anything like that. But the first, before we ever talk about how do we do things in worship, we need to talk about what worship is. What are we doing? Uh, and you've got on the screen basically some, some uh, captures from various Greek lexicons to try to explain this word to us. And the, the Greek word proskuneo is basically a compound word uh, that you've got the, the prefix pros, P-O-S, which, which means you're doing something toward something. And you've got the Greek word for kiss. And so it means that you kiss toward. That's kind of a weird word for worship, isn't it? I mean, it, if you were to come up with, all right, what, what, what's a good way, what's a good way to, to talk about worship? Would you have come up with the word kiss? I, I, that, you know, that, that would not, if I was trying to think of a word to say, here's what worship is, I don't know that I would think of the word kiss. Why not? Why not? Free open game. If I ask a question and pause long enough to get an answer, throw one in. Why not? Ooh, you think of something really intimate, right? When, when you think of, I mean, because who do you kiss? Uh, don't answer that. I won't, I won't pause long enough for you to answer that question. But who do you kiss? I mean, this is, this is an intimate action, right? I mean, this isn't, this isn't you walk up and you place an order and somebody says, would you like some fries with that? And you lean over and give them a kiss. I mean, they, they, no, I mean, unless... Unless your daughter works at Chick-fil-A, then maybe, but, but then that would still be inappropriate, right? But this is an intimate act, right? So you, God says, here's the word I want to use for worship, and it means to kiss toward. This is something that, that indicates a, a very close relationship. It is something that indicates that, that I really like this person. You don't kiss just anybody. But it's not, it, it, it goes beyond that, at least in the Greek language, it goes beyond that. This is something that, um, that servants would do when they came in before their master. This is something subjects would do when they came in before the king. It was not just kiss toward, but the word indicated that, that you, would prost, you would prostrate yourself, you would fall down before and kiss the ground and even put your forehead against the ground and kiss the ground and, and if you were close enough you would kiss their feet 
So now you've gone from the kiss element of intimacy, closeness, to what do you think of when, when you're down on the ground, head on the, head on the forehead on the ground? Say it again. Somebody said it. Submission. So it's not just I feel close to you. It is that I am submitting myself to you. I am bowing myself down before you. I am, I am giving you all of the honor and the reverence that I know how to give. I mean, th- th- think about that. Do, when, we go, when we come before God in worship, do we, do we go toe-to-toe with Him? Nose-to-nose with Him? When, when we, that, that's not worship. It, when, when, when you think about it in a, in, a, in, a, in a heart sense, we're not standing toe-to-toe, knee-to-knee with Him. We are, we're down before Him bowing down in homage of who he is. Not, not in fear, not, not because we're shaking, but because of a sense of unworthiness, a sense of awe in his presence. So before we talk about what I do when I stand up and lead in worship, I've got to have that mentality before I ever stand up there. That I, it's not, I am a worshiper in the leading of worship. And when I, if I'm helping to lead and serve in worship, I am a worshiper that is helping other worshipers to worship God. And the attention is not on me. The attention is on how can I help all of us to fall down in love and admiration and honor of God and kiss in His direction. What worship is. And so here here are three things that I think this word kind of implies for us. Number one, we've already mentioned. I think this word implies a a real intimacy with God. Um, Generally speaking, and, and, and I know this can be done remotely, but generally speaking, when you kiss somebody, are you rather close to them? Not a hard question, right? Now, you, you can throw somebody a kiss, or your grandchildren could be on Skype, uh, you know, in some other part of the nation or some other part of the world, and your grandchildren in some other part of the world can throw you a kiss, and that's pretty good too. But generally speaking, when you think about kissing somebody or even throwing somebody a kiss, you're close to them. Uh, and, and, not, and, and so you, closeness, closeness is one of those words that has different meanings, right? We could talk about closeness in proximity. How close are we to God in proximity when we worship? Is he in our midst? Is he right here? Yeah. You know, so, sometimes kids grow up with the mentality that, you know, we've got we've to get our prayers outside of the building and get them high enough so that they'll reach God. Except God's right here. So in proximity, we're close. But not just physical proximity. What about heart closeness? If I'm going to worship God, how close do I need to feel to my God? So there's this, this, this proskuneo idea has, a, has an intimacy part of it that as a leader or a, a servant in worship, I need to remember that. We're trying to draw ourselves closer to God. And that's what these passages in Hebrews 4 uh, teach us, is, is that we, we are coming right into the presence of God, coming near unto God. Second thing that I think this word implies is that when you worship, that there is intent behind it. Can you worship God accidentally? No, no I don't think you're going to worship God accidentally. You can do a lot of things accidentally and, and, and get by with it, right? Um, but you're not going to worship. This is something that your heart is intending to do. Uh, and so in John chapter 4, Jesus says that the Father is seeking true worshipers. True worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And then in John chapter 4, verse 34, he says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him. Think about that word must. God is spirit. Those who worship him 
must worship Him in spirit and in truth. There is an intent behind this. There, there is a purpose behind this. That when I come to worship God, I'm not just doing this haphazardly. I'm not just randomly doing this. I'm not just doing this well because it's Sunday and well, this is what we do on Sunday. I am going there for the express purpose of worshiping God. That's, that's what proskuneo is. It's something you do with an express purpose. You desire to do it. The, the, third thing, the third thing that I think is implied in this word is that there has to be some inward activity. Look in Matthew chapter 15. I know you, I know, you know this passage, but look, you look in Matthew chapter 15, and, and Jesus did not have uh, very nice things to say on this occasion uh, towards the... Uh, towards the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, they come to him in Matthew chapter 15, and as they often were doing, uh, they were trying to test him by things that they were asking him. But uh, when you drop down in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus calls them hypocrites. Matthew 15, verse 7, hypocrites, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you? Well, what did Isaiah prophesy about them? These people draw near to me with their mouth. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? In worship, is that what we're doing? Do we, do we say things with our mouth to draw us near to God? I need thee every hour. O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. I love you, Lord. There are words coming from my mouth that are, that are drawing me to God. But what does Jesus say here? These people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips. Our God is an awesome God. O oh Lord my God, how great thou art. They honor me with their lips, comma. And then this three-letter three letter word, but. Well, it sounded really good. They, they draw near with their mouths, honor with their lips, but what's the problem? Their hearts are far from me. Proskuneo is not just, proskuneo done right, is not just an outward Activity. We talked about the physical side of it, how, how there is the, the falling down, the, the literally in those days when, when the slaves and, and those, that there would be the literal side, the physical side, falling down in front of, and the literal side of kissing. You suppose there was ever anybody who did the physical, who was falling down in front of the, the master, the king, and, and bowing and prostrating, head on the ground and kissing their feet, that the inside was thinking something else? You think there was anybody that ever did that? Oh, I can't stand you. I'm going to do this because I have to, but oh, I don't want it. You think there was anybody ever doing that? That on the outside, they were doing everything right. But on the inside, oh boy, they were somewhere else. What about us when we worship? When we proskuneo, does there need to be some inward heart activity that's going on? Now, when you are leading in worship, guess, guess what people in the auditorium sometimes have the hardest time focusing on the proscaneo, have the hardest time focusing on the inward activity? Sometimes it's the people leading for a variety of reasons. They're nervous. Uh, they're thinking about, you know, if you're leading the opening prayer, sometimes you're not worshiping in the first few songs. Not because you're intending to be uh, obtuse about it, but what are you thinking about sometimes when you're leading the opening prayer during those first few songs? What am I going to say in the opening prayer? So what have you done in those first two songs? Those words have been coming out, and, and, and it, you know, it, it might be bass, it might be tenor, it might blend beautifully. Where's the heart? Well, the heart wasn't there behind those songs because the heart was thinking about the prayer. Now, do you need to think about what you're going to pray about before you get up? Yes, please do. <laughs> you know, but some, all I'm saying is sometimes the leaders are the ones who have the harder time staying focused on, on actually worshiping. You know, sometimes the song leader himself is not always thinking about the words as much as he's thinking about the notes, as he's thinking about the tempo, as he's thinking about what verse am I going to lead, as he's thinking about why are they dragging, as he's thinking about did, did I miss something here, did I miss a note. Did, his, his mind is, and sometimes he's not thinking about the words. Uh, and so 
as a leader, what that means is if I am, if I am responsible for helping others to proskuneo, I've really got to help myself to focus on proskuneo. That takes effort. I mean, it takes effort to worship even if you're not leading, right? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's hard to play. It's hard to keep up with your games on the phone and sing the songs and, and partake of the communion all at the same time, right? I mean, it, you're just distracted in all these different directions. You know, it, it's, it's, hard. it's hard sometimes when there's a baby screaming in one part of the auditorium and, and teenagers messing around in another part of the auditorium and, and, somebody, and somebody hacking their lungs out in the back part of the auditorium. It's hard to keep in tune, Right? So as men in the congregation, what do we need to do? We need to do what we can to make sure that we are remembering what worship is all about. When we sit in the pews and when we stand up to take a leadership role, that before we think about the mechanics, we make sure that we think about we're trying to worship God. Does that make sense? I'm, anybody got any thoughts or comments about any? Any of that from a, a biblical perspective? Yes, Bob. Yes, and, and that, that would be an encouragement to anyone who takes a leadership role in the worship is that you pray in advance, uh, asking God to help. You know, you know sometimes, sometimes we think about, well, I, I'm, I'm doing this again in worship. Man, I've, I've done this ten times before. It's, it's old hat to me. I can get up there and lead a prayer anytime. Hang on a second. We're worshiping God. The, the, this, ought to, this ought to be the, the, the highlight of, of our week. And, and if, I, if I have the opportunity, uh, well, here, here's the next point. If I have the privilege of being able to lead in worship, I ought to want to give my best to that. I, I, I ought to want to prepare myself to the, to the utmost in that. Uh, the, the, the point that's made here is that it's always been, it's always been a privilege to lead in worship. And, and the passage that's on there is in Luke chapter 1. And you turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what's happening in, at the beginning of Luke chapter 1. You're not reading about the birth of Jesus yet. Before we read about the, uh, the conception and the birth of Jesus, who are we reading about in Luke chapter 1? Zacharias. Zacharias and Elizabeth. But specifically at first about Zacharias. Zacharias, Luke chapter 1 and verse 5 says that he was a certain, he was a priest. He was a certain priest named Zacharias. And then it makes this statement, of the division of Abijah. Of the division, what does that mean? Of the division. Well, David had divided the priests into 24 divisions. He, he had divided the priests uh, up into uh, 24 courses. And so, each of, the, each of these priests would fit, and, and so here's uh, Zacharias, who's, who's said to be of, of the division, uh, or of the course of Abijah, and there were 24 of these courses. Now, each of these divisions served at the temple for one week. They would serve from Sabbath to Sabbath. And they would only serve every 24 weeks. So if, if Zacharias in the division of Abijah gets to serve, once, serve one week, but every 24 weeks, he's a priest, how often does he get to serve at the temple? Twice a year. So all he gets to serve at the temple is twice a year. And he'll do it for seven days. Now, what, what he does at the temple, that's determined by lot, not, not capital L-O-A-O-T, but lowercase l-o-t. Look down in, in verse 8. So it was while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to, what's he going to get to do this time when he goes to the temple? Well, this time he's going to get to burn incense when he went to the temple of the Lord. That was his job that time. And next time he went, it might be a different job. 
But this time, he gets to burn incense when he goes before the Lord. I want you to imagine being a priest, and specifically here being Zacharias. And you are the one who gets to go in and burn incense. Maybe he had never done this job before. Maybe he had seen other guys get this job, but maybe he, at some point, he had the first time that he got to go and burn incense. What do you think would be going through his mind? Would it just be, oh, you know, it's just another day at the office. No, I get to, I get to be the one to go before the Lord and, and, and to burn the incense. Wow, I get to be that one who goes in there. But the next time he would get to do that, or even have the opportunity, wouldn't be for another half a year. And the priest only served publicly from the age of 30 to 50. So they only had opportunities publicly to serve for 20 years, and in those 20 years they'd only have an opportunity to serve during the year probably twice, every 24 weeks. Um, the, the other... Uh, when, when, when certain feast days like Passover and Pentecost and uh, Feast of Tabernacles came around, then all of the priests would, would come together and work. But what I'm trying to say is, think about the privilege that that would be to Zacharias. How often do I get to serve? Only twice a year. And only for 20 years, and that's it. And if I get to be the one that goes and gets to do whatever the task is, would it be, oh, well, I, I, I got on... I got on Mike's list again. All right, Mike's calling me again. Yes, Mike, I'll be the one to offer the incense. Oh, fine, yes, I'll be there. You think that's Zacharias? Oh, when he saw his name on the list. Yes. I get to be involved in the service of the Lord. What a privilege it would have been for him or for any priest to have that opportunity. And, and sometimes just... Uh, you can go and research uh, First, Second Chronicles and, and some of the teachings that are there. Uh, we, we just don't have time to look at all of the details of those that talks about the divisions that, that, that David put them into. But all I want us to see is what an honor that would have been. Do we have that same sense of privilege and honor when our name is on Mike's list? I get to do this. I get to help God's people come before him in worship. So it's not just that it was an honor for them. It wasn't just a, necessarily just a privilege for them. It continues to be and always will be a privilege for us. We should want to serve. And so on the last bulletin of the month, the last bulletin of every month, on page 6, when that list comes out of those to serve, that ought to be the first page I go to in the last bulletin of the month. I mean, I, I know there's some really good articles that are on pages two and three that are just going to knock your socks off, all right? But page six and that last bullet's in the month, where am I? 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 Now, as I understand it, there's a handful of guys who may not be on that list because we've got just a few more guys than we can fit on the list. Does that mean that you won't be used that month? Well, you could be. Mike, you ever used any substitutes before? Uh, and occasionally. Um, so, but where's my name? What do I get to do? And to see it not as, oh, honey, put down the 12th. We got to be there at night. We got to be there on Sunday night. The 12th. Mike put me on Sunday night again? Man, I've told him not to put me on Sunday night. Or do I look at it and say, I get to help God's people worship him like Zacharias would have thought about having that kind of privilege that's the way we've got to see it we've got to focus on proscaneo we need to focus on the privilege and then I would encourage each of us when when we have an assignment given to us that we focus on the purpose of that assignment what's the purpose behind it go, go to first Corinthians chapter 14 and again I know these are these are a couple passages that you will know but in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40, and this is in the context of talking about uh, the worship assembly, and uh, Paul had given some very specific instructions uh, for some things that were to, uh, how the worship assembly was to be uh, taken care of and, and structured. 
uh, and uh, things kept in certain order. And so he says in the last verse of this chapter in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. Is that, is that a good verse for worship? Um, should, should, should our worship be random and chaotic? No, sir. We're coming before the master. We're coming before the king of kings. We're coming before the Lord of lords. We're coming before our savior who died for us on the cross. And do we want to just be haphazard in this? Oh, no. We want to be ready for this. We want to be prepared for this. We, we, we want to know what we're going to do and, and to see that there is a design that, that has, one, there's a design that God has put in place uh, for, eat, for us in our worship. Back in verse 26, it says, when you come together, let all things be done for edification. Can, can chaos produce edification? Can, can, can chaos and randomness in worship, can that, can that build you up uh, spiritually? Can, 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 that, can that help you grow in your faith uh, in, in the Lord? No, it, it's, it's chaos. And that's why, verse, that's why verse 33 of this chapter says, God is not the author of, you know what it says? Confusion. God's not the author of confusion. And so what God wants in, in his worship assembly is decency and order uh, to those things that happen. And so uh, that's why we have certain men assigned and we don't just randomly say, okay, after this song, we'll have the opening prayer and the song leader sits down and we're just looking around. Okay, who's going to lead the opening prayer? You know, we're going to play Jack in the Box again and see who pops up first. Uh, no, there's order. There, there's assignments that are made. Uh, there, there is, there is a, uh, an assignment. There is a, uh, there's, that's why we have a meeting in this room. Uh, you know, is, is to make sure everybody's on the same page so that when we walk in here and when we lead in worship, we're all together. We know what we're doing uh, because we want the focus of worship not to be on us. And the more decently and the more in order we do things, the more invisible the leaders become. Does that make sense? The more decently and in order the worship leaders conduct themselves and go through the service, the less we think about them and the more we think about God. For example, and, and I, I won't pick on anybody up here, um, and I'm not really picking on anybody at all. Um, those times where we have had electrical issues, uh, electrical storms, those, those times when we've had certain things happen where the sound system doesn't work like we expect it to work. Why do everybody's eyes all of a sudden go and look at these guys sitting over here thinking that they're messing something up when it's not their fault at all? There's just some foul up in the system, but what do we do? We all look over here to say, what are you all doing over here? What's happened to our worship? Are we, are we proscaneo anymore? Nope. We're done proscaneo. You know, it, we're, we're, we're like that, that, that animal that just, you know, we're perched up. We're looking around. What's going on? What's going on? We're, we're not prostrate anymore. Our focus has been taken off of God. And so decently in order means we're totally focused on God. And, we're, you know, if it's, if it's Joe that's leading the prayer, or Don that's leading the prayer, or David that's leading the prayer, or Paul, it doesn't matter who's leading the prayer because they're taking me to the throne of God. That, that's, that's, the, that's what I need to see. That's what I need to see in my purpose. And so that's, that's, the, case with every, that's the case with every avenue of worship. Whatever I am assigned to do in worship, I need to think, what is the purpose of this in our worship? It's interesting, God gives very specific purpose statements for preachers. Um, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, preachers are to preach the word. They're to be instant in season and out of season. What, is the per what are they to do in preaching? Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what preachers are supposed to do. Preachers in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 2 and 3, says that, we, that, preacher, that preaching is to be uh, about edification, uh, exhortation, and comfort. So preachers get their purpose statements right out of these texts and say, here's the purpose of preaching in worship. And it doesn't need to go outside those purposes. That's where it needs to fit. Well, what about those who lead prayers? What about those who lead singing? Do they have a purpose statement? 
What, what's, what's, the, what's the purpose statement for, if, if, we, were to, if we were to come up with a, a purpose statement or a thesis statement, we talk about thesis statements in leadership training camp, um, if we were to come up with a thesis statement for song leaders, uh, would it be something like, uh, the song leaders are the guys who pick out the songs and they wave their hands. And that's their purpose statement. Well, do the song leaders pick out the songs? Yes. Do they get up there and wave their hand? Yes. Is that their purpose statement? No, that's, that's, that's something that they, that they have to do as a part of, uh, of leading in worship. But that's, that's not their purpose statement. What's their purpose statement? Their purpose statement is to help worshipers enter into the presence of God and to praise His name. That's what song leaders are supposed to do. And to keep themselves out of the picture, and to help just be a, I like to use the word conduit, to be the conduit through which worshipers get to worship God. And so song leaders, and, and you could say this about every one of these other avenues of worship and the men who lead there, Song leaders are to help us to enter right in the presence of God and to honor, glorify, and magnify His name. Now, will that purpose then determine the picking out of songs? Oh, well, they're supposed to pick out songs, but it's got to fit within that purpose statement. And so as a song leader, you need to determine, what is my purpose statement? What is it that, first of all, what is it that God wants me to do as a song leader? And then secondly, and, and not to dismiss this, but then secondly under that is, what do the elders of this congregation expect of me, of me to do in leading songs in this worship? Uh, what, what, what do the elders, you know, and, and so um, when we think about the songs that we sing in worship, here, here's, 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 something, here's something personal. Okay, here's something personal from me, and I've never known anybody to do this, so I'm not picking on anybody. But if we come together to worship, and the first song we sing is, Lead Me to Some Soul Today. Is there anything wrong with that? No, there wouldn't be, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then the second song is about seeing lost souls. And then the third song is about seeing lost souls. Nothing wrong with that. But I haven't praised God yet. Not directly in my song. Does it, you know, again, this is personal. You, you can disagree with me, and we can both be wrong. Um, but when we come together and sing, it doesn't mean we shouldn't sing, lead me to some soul today in our worship. I'm not saying that at all. But we need to make sure as song leaders that we are helping the congregation focus on God. What does Ephesians 5.19 say? Speaking to one another, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I need to make sure my songs are helping me sing to the Lord and to praise and to honor Him. And, and, and within, that, within that purpose, is, is helping the congregation to, to speak to one another and to sing to one another. And so it's, it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes as a song leader to pick songs. Uh, and and there's, there's about four or five song leaders in here right now. It's sometimes difficult to pick songs, isn't it? You know, because, well, I don't want to pick that one because he just led that one last week. I don't want to pick that one because of this one. I don't want to pick that. And so there's difficulty in picking some songs. Sometimes you want to pick songs that, well, we haven't sung this one in a while. Or we want to pick songs, well, I don't think I've ever heard this one sung. Uh, and, and so we, we ought to try that one. What's our purpose statement? Is the purpose statement, well, we ought to sing all 990 songs in the book. Is that my purpose statement as a song leader? Or is my purpose statement to bring the congregation into God's presence and to praise Him? And then that will help determine what kind of songs I choose and what songs I choose. Um, and there's more I want to say on that, but I'm, I'm going to skip for just a minute. What about prayer leaders? Is there a purpose statement for prayer leaders? Does there need to be a purpose statement? Sure. 
Is it uh, keep my prayer within five minutes? Is that my purpose statement? Uh, what, what's, what's the purpose statement? Uh, get up there and, uh, and make sure I list everybody on the bulletin. Is that my purpose statement? I mean, these are things you might do. What's your purpose statement? And then that helps you determine what, what's in the prayer. Uh, is, is the opening prayer. Does the opening prayer perhaps have a different purpose statement than the closing prayer? I mean, they're both prayers, so in general, they're going to have similar... But are they, do they have a different purpose? In the worship assembly, do they have a different purpose? Is, is the closing prayer, does it have the same uh, intention as that opening prayer? Lord, we come before you in this worship assembly. We, we pray that you'll help our hearts to be in tune and praise you. And, 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 and there's a number of things that can be included in that opening prayer. But in the closing prayer, especially when everybody is standing and don't necessarily want to be standing for a long time, uh, it is the closing prayer have a different flavor to it. If we've already prayed for all of the sick, and if we've already prayed for the president, the vice president, and the, and the, and the, and the cabinet, and we've already prayed for all of them, and we've already prayed for all, do I need to pray for everything else and repeat everything else in that closing prayer, or is the closing prayer something that should be succinct and help us to wrap our minds around the fact we've just been in the presence of God and thank you, God, for letting us be here and be with us and help us be the light of the world. Ha has, a different, has a different purpose statement. What, what about the presiders? What's their purpose statement? Um, is the purpose statement for the presider, well, I need to come up with something new this week. You know, we... we we keep reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I, I'm just, I'm not going to do that. Everybody else reads from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to come up with something new. Is that my purpose statement? No, that's, that's not my purpose statement. That's no, the presider. What's my purpose statement as a presider? The focus. To get all of us back to the cross. Not the empty tomb. The cross of Jesus and to, and to his body and to his blood. I hate, to share, I hate to make this revelation to some guys, but there's not a new way to do that. There's not a new Bible verse that you're going to pull out that's going to do that. There's nothing wrong with 1 Corinthians 11 being what we read every Sunday. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with using some of the other passages that are, that are used sometimes, but what's our purpose? Get us back to the cross to remember to discern the Lord's body and to examine myself. That's the purpose of the Lord's Supper. And so that needs to be the purpose of the presider. And I'm not picking on anybody. I have nobody in mind that I'm trying to pick on when I'm saying it. I'm talking about we have a purpose. God's given us the design in our worship. And we need to think, what is my purpose in this? How can I help all of the worshipers to get back to the cross? And, and to help all of us to reflect upon what Jesus did for us I don't need to make it fresh and new. Jesus dying for me makes it fresh and new every week. I just need to help worshipers get back there. And so we need to think about the privilege and we need to think about the purpose. Let me mention this one real quick. We need to think about the perception of visitors. Now this is secondary to everything I've already said, okay? Because worship is not about the visitors. Worship is about God. Worship is about praising God. But if I am involved in leading in worship, I not only need to remember my purpose statement, it would probably be good for me to hear things through the ears and see things through the eyes of visitors. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. New King James uses the word uninformed. If an uninformed person comes in your midst, the first thing he says is, Will they be able to say amen to your prayer? He's talking about tongues there. But if, if somebody can't understand what we're saying in our prayers, can they say amen? And so we, we, we need to think about how, how are people hearing me, not just visitors, but everybody. How are they hearing me when I'm leading? Will they be able to say amen? And then he talks about, and again, it's in the context of tongues, which tongues are not here today, but the application is still there, where he says, could they come in your midst and, and, and see all of this chaos that's happening in assembly and say, wow, these people are out of their minds. 
Is it possible that a visitor to a, to a worship assembly today could do that? Could come in and say, wow, these people are they're kind of strange. Now, I'm not talking about because we preach a certain doctrine and we ought to stop preaching a certain doctrine so they don't think we're strange. I'm talking about in leading in worship. Do I need to think about the songs that I select and how the visitors will hear those songs? There are some songs that we don't sing well. Do we need to lead those songs that we don't sing well? The visitors already think, wow, these people need an instrument. They're missing an instrument. These people need an instrument. They already think that because it's not here. But if we sing a song that we don't sing well, guess what we've just reinforced for them? Wow, these people, they're not very good. They need an instrument to help them. Now, please don't mishear me when I say that, okay? There are some songs... And I'm going to tie this in. It doesn't apply to every song I just mentioned. There are some songs that are not written for congregational singing. We see this a lot in the youth songs. That there are youth songs, and not just youth songs, but more songs, that are written for a band. That are written for, you know, some kind of uh, entertainment industry where they've got all of these instruments and they've got all of these singers and, it's, and it, it is written for a concert. You can't bring that into worship. There's some songs that, that have been able to come over in some sense and been changed to an a cappella congregation. But you, there's just some songs that if they're not going to work in a cappella congregational singing, we ought not to sing them. We need to be able to lift up our voices together and hear it through the, through, through the ears of visitors, hear our prayers through the ears of visitors. When we preside, people, when, when visitors are here, do they understand the Lord's Supper? It's not, we don't need to go into a sermon about it. Presiders don't need to preach, okay? They don't need to preach a whole second sermon. But is it helpful to explain? Here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Here's how often we do it. Uh, so that visitors can, can learn to appreciate these things. It, it, is, it is incredibly wonderful how many visitors leave this assembly having fallen in love with the beauty of New Testament worship because they've never experienced it before. They leave here, and I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about God. I'm not talking about how well we do something. I'm talking about God's design and God's plan for something. They've never experienced it before. And so we need to think about that as we think about leading worship. Again, the focus is not on visitors, but we, must, we, we should not take a leadership role without taking them into consideration. All right, here's, here's where we get to some nuts and bolts. And I've got three minutes to get through some of these, um, and I wanted to have more time for this. If your name is on the list to lead, here's some things we need to do. Number one, where's number one? Get up here. First of all, I need to look at the list. Last bulletin of the month. Look up, see if your name is there. Find your name there. If your name's there, get your calendar out and mark it up. Tell your wife, mark it up. I need, I need to remember that I am leading on this day. Look up, mark up, and then connect up with Mike. Mike sends out emails. How many of you have ever gotten an email from Mike because you had some role? Ha! Mike, they got them. They did get they just admitted that they received your emails. All right. Verdict. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're court court dismissed. I mean, we just we just got them to admit it. Okay. So when you get an email from Mike, there is a button that says R-E-P-L-Y. Hit it. And then type a Y or an N. You don't, even, you don't even have to say yes or no. I know that's a lot. To type three letters or two letters, you can just type one letter, Y or N. Send. Boom. You need to do that for you. You need to do that for Mike. Connect up with Mike. When he asks you, when he reminds you, don't avoid Mike when you come in and he's sitting on that pew. Don't come in the other door because you know he's there. Connect up with him. Make sure he knows that you know what you're doing and you've agreed to do it. And then man up. If you say you're going to do something, do it. If you say you're going to be here, yes, Mike, I got your email, yes. Yes, Mike, I know you told me, yes. If you've said you're going to do it, then, then, then be here and do it. Write up. If you're in charge of write, leading a prayer or presiding, write it out. Take notes up there. I, 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 think, 
I think some of the best prayers in this congregation are from individuals who take some sort of outline, some bullet points, even writing out, because they, it's obvious they have put some thought into this, and it's not just whatever comes off the top of their head. Nothing wrong with what most of you have come off the top of your head, but nothing wrong with right up what you're going to say. It helps take, keep you focused, helps keep you within your purpose statement too. And then show up. Show up when? 15 minutes early. If you're past that, Mike has already replaced you. Show up 15 minutes early. It's not going to hurt to do that. Do you think Zacharias showed up late, by the way? Zacharias, you're going to be, you're going to be offering the, 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 the burn incense. Great. So I'll get there about 10 minutes late and I can still do it, right? No. You know he got there early. It's a great privilege for him to do it. Number two, line up. Get in the room. Show up. Line up, be where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be, wherever it is, evening or night, whatever next, dress up. That doesn't mean you've got to wear a tuxedo. You know that. But we're coming before the creator of this universe. We're coming before our Savior. And we ought to want to look as good as we can look. It doesn't mean you've got to wear a tux. But we need to offer him our best. And that's for Sunday night too. Show up ready, ready to serve. We had one member here. Years ago, we had one member here who learned that on Sunday nights, if he showed up nicely dressed, Mike would probably use him as a substitute. Guess what he did every Sunday night? He, he, he didn't come in, he, he wasn't in a suit or anything, I'm not saying that. But he just came in nicely dressed. Guess how often Mike needed a substitute? And he was the go-to guy. Be Mike's go-to guy. That when he's looking for somebody that can be used... You're, you're that guy. Whatever next. Let me throw these up here. We're almost done. Speak up when you get there. We didn't have time to talk about that. You need to project your voice. You need to talk like there's no microphone up there and you're talking to people on the back row. Speak clearly. Enunciate. Don't mumble. Uh, speak so that people can understand. Uh, uh, what are we up to? Hold up. What does that mean? Um, don't do somebody else's job. Uh, if, if you're given an assignment... You know, hold yourself back from trying to encroach on, on what everybody else is supposed to do. Direct the attention towards God. Keep the attention off of yourself. And then finally, reach up. Stretch yourself. Do something. Be willing to try to do something you haven't done before. Um, whatever that might be. If you've never led a prayer, uh, say to Mike, Hey, Mike, uh, let, me lead, let, let me try leading a closing prayer sometime. Um, but uh, stretch yourself to, to do more. Um, I, I, I think most of the guys in here are on Mike's list, but if you're not on Mike's list, if he doesn't know what you're willing to do, tell him. We're going to have a Sunday here where we set Mike up in the lobby and, and just let him give access to all men. But, hey, you wouldn't hurt his feelings tonight if you just checked with him and said, hey, you know what you want me to do, right? Um, what an awesome privilege. Number one, we get to worship God. What an awesome privilege, number two, that as the men in the church, we get an opportunity to lead and to serve. It's not about us. And the moment we think it is, I hope we'll remove ourselves from the list. It's not about us. It's about being that conduit where we can help other people proskuneo before God. Mike, anything that we need to throw in here. What an awesome privilege. Thank you all for your attention tonight. We've covered a lot of ground, and I appreciate you staying a couple extra minutes.